My name is Sandra Blum, and I'm the events co-chair of the Fairfield League of Women Voters. And on behalf of the Fairfield League, we want to welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, John. We want to welcome you tonight and to thank Fairfield University for partnering with us in bringing you this event, redistricting, how is it done, and why is that important? We created this free public series because we think the issues before us are so complex, they deserve more than a single presentation or panel. For example, the next session on December 7th will put the spotlight on redistricting in the news. What becomes news? And how in a process that happens mainly outside of the public view, Oh, and how, what becomes news and how in a process that happens mainly outside of the public's view? I have to read my own writing. The series will conclude in late January, so stay tuned. Now a little about us. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. It influences public policy, through education and advocacy. The League welcomes women and men of all ages as members. The League um, was founded in 1920 to defend women's right to vote. We have been and are an activist grassroots organization, all volunteers pretty much. I should add the League is nonprofit or no profit. <laughs> I'd like to quote what Ch Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote for the majority in 1964 on Reynolds versus Sims before we move on to the program. I have to take a breath in here. <laughs> <laughs> the right to vote freely for the candidate of one's choice is the essence of a democratic society. And any restrictions on that right strike at the heart of representative government and the right of suffrage can be denied by a debasement or dilution of the weight of a citizen's vote just as effectively as by wholly prohibiting the free exercise of the franchise. <sighs> Dr. Gail Alberta, whose research focuses on the intersection of election laws, political participation, and civic engagement and election administration will take it from here. Thanks, Gail. Okay. All right, thank you. And thank you all for being here and thank the League for uh, allowing us to be part of their series. So as uh, indicated, I am Dr. Gail Alberta. I'm an assistant professor of politics um, and the director of the Masters of Public Administ Administration program here at Fairfield. Uh, tonight's collaboration, or presentation is a collaboration of various fields of study and different types of analysis. So as uh, indicated, my research focuses on election laws, election administration, and the intersections with that with political participation. Mamet Jansay, no, Jansoy, mm -hmm. sorry about that, uh, is an assistant professor of psychology in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, where he researches the relationship between technology and inequality, specifically the emergence of online platforms in the gig economy. Jonathan Delgado uh, serves as the assistant director for the Community Engagement community engaged research program in the Center for Social Impact. In this role, he works with staff, faculty, and students to design and implement research projects with community partners. And joining us later during question and answer time, Dr. Kurt uh, Schickling uh, is a professor of emeritus in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. His research focuses on using GIS and census data to study the spatial organization of American society at the neighborhood level. In addition, uh, Dr. John Soy and I brought this project into our classroom. Our students conducted research and built websites that either explain redistricting or offer insights on how other electoral democ democracies ensure things like political equality, representation, and enumeration. 
a tall order that I think we can say we're proud that they not only met, but surpassed. So the first step in the process of allocation is enumeration, which is found in Article I of the US Constitution. The enumeration clause tells us three main things. One, that we have to do actual enumeration or an actual headcount. Two, how often this actual headcount must occur. And three, that Congress has discretion in determining the details of that count. So how do we do this? We complete an actual count of people in the US every 10 years through the US Census. Once it's complete, the data is used to determine apportionment, the allocation of US House seats to the states after each census. Since Congress has discretion in determining the details of the method of allocation, it has adopted a method of equal proportion in 1929. So as people move from state to state, the number of congressional seats each state receives is gonna fluctuate. Once the states know the number of congressional seats they will have after the census, the states begin drawing these new district lines. This is the process called redistricting. The states have discretion over drawing these lines. They must meet certain criteria. They must be uh, continuous. Uh, they cannot be divided into two separate parts of a state. And these are all conditions that will be discussed more um, in more detail later in this presentation. In addition, the US Supreme Court ruled that districts must be equal in population. In Gary versus Sanders in 1963, the court wrote, the concept of political equality from the Declaration of Independence to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to the 14th, 15th, 17th, and 19th Amendments can only mean one thing, one person, one vote. And indeed, the court has overturned redistricting plans with populations that deviate in district by 0.7%. And all this ties into representation, therefore political power. How do we draw district lines to best represent voters? This is the heart of the presentation tonight. We will highlight how district lines can meet the criteria, how they can dilute or enhance voters, and how the lines can meet all the requirements yet still look a little weird. And on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Uh, John Soy. Thank you, Gail. So hi everyone, I'm going to talk about a couple of things here and we're gonna start with a very simple idea. So let's assume we have this district made up of 36 voters, the purple voters have one pro political preference, the orange voters have another one. And uh, what I want us to understand is in most political systems across the world, in such a district you would usually end up with two the elected representatives from each party. The purple party would get two of them, the orange party would get the two others. Now the problem is, when we gerrymander, especially the way we do it in the United States, we can change that, equal, uh, that balance a little bit. The first way we can do it is by packing minority voters, in this case the orange party voters, into a single district. So imagine we ended up with four districts nine people in each of them that ended up looking like this one. As you can see in the middle district, all Orange Party voters are packed. They get that, that's a very safe district for them. They're going to win every election there. But then in the rest of the districts, they're always a permanent minority. They're never going to be able to win that. So this is the packing process. The opposite of this is the cracking process where you dilute the uh, votes of the minority party supporters to the point where they don't have any seats in which they are actually uh, competitive. That's the cracking. And we can draw a, uh, four cracked seats very easily with this map. We will just draw those two little U shapes there. And suddenly, instead of a two-two split, you would have a four-nothing uh, purple party win without changing anything, without doing any political campaigning, without having to do any of these changes. So gerrymandering is a problem because of this, because it ultimately uh, is an end run around doing politics the way most of us understand it. The other problem here is, uh, well, the other thing I want to note here is that 
you don't need to do either or. So you don't need to do either packing or cracking. For uh, many gerrymandered maps, both of these processes uh, are applied usually at the same time. So we're going to take a look at a couple of examples of this uh, in the real world, actually. So this is the 2016 North Carolina map uh, because uh, North Carolina redrew their maps after the 2010 census, and it was ruled unconstitutional. They tried to redraw it in 2013. That was also ruled unconstitutional. And in 2016, the Supreme Court of the state had to draw their lines. That was because North Carolina was uh, violating one of the principal rules that govern our uh, redistricting process, which is uh, not diluting communities of interest, in this case, uh, the black vote in Durham, Raleigh, and uh, God, what's the third city there? Wilmington. No, not Wilmington. Charlotte. Charlotte. Thank you very much. So uh, this was the 2016 map. Uh, we can also see examples of cracking. So uh, let's take a look at Texas 10 years before then. On the left-hand side here, you see uh, the 2002 uh, districts in Texas, and you can see Austin split up into two seats. The little pink area south and east of Austin is a safe Democratic seat in 2002, and the uh, uh, yellow district is a safe Republican seat. In 2004, when the Texas maps are redrawn, Austin is cracked into three, and no part of Austin elects a Democratic representative anymore. Now, what uh, is important to get is that this is not necessarily a new problem. So this is the famous gerrymander cartoon. Uh, it's from 18, uh, 1812 and from Massachusetts. I used to live in Boston uh, for a while, and I can already tell you like the interest of people in Chelsea, which is basically a suburb of Boston, and the interest of people like north of Newburyport are not, were not the same 200 years ago. They're not the same now. But uh, this district was drawn up in the, uh, before the election of 18, after the election of 1812, I think. And it ended up being the, uh, uh, being the uh, phenomenon where we get the name gerrymander from. Because the idea was this looked like a salamander. And it was, uh, the governor of Massachusetts' uh, last name was Jerry. So this became a gerrymander after the governor. So it's not a new problem. And as we'll talk about at the end, it's not necessarily an American problem, a uniquely American problem either, but it's a uniquely bad problem in America. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at a couple of other districts that uh, we uh, have been dealing with more recently. So you've probably seen headlines like this all the time. This was a district drawn in uh, Pennsylvania, so this is this connects the suburbs of Philly to more rural areas of the state. And the idea being basically to dilute the votes in the suburbs of Philly that tend to go more democratic uh, and uh, basically create a safe Republican seat. Uh, so Washington Post named it uh, uh, goofy, kicking, goofy Kicking Donald Duck. Uh, in I think this was from 2016, Gail? I think yeah. so, yeah. But in this case, this is a partisan gerrymander, and, but it was a legal one. So Goofy Kicking Donald Duck is still around. This year it might change. I think it's going to change, given the population shifts in uh, Philly especially. But we have other legal gerrymanders here as well. So for example, Ohio Snake by the Lake is a famous one. Uh, this was, uh, basically this used to be two separate districts on, up until 2012. And then in 2012, uh, the state legislature of Ohio basically merged big population centers of two formerly Democratic districts, pitting two incumbent Democratic uh, like representatives against one another, diluting the votes in, like for example, the suburbs of uh, big city uh, Cleveland here, and then Toledo here, connecting them by like the tennis margins that they could. Now, not all funny looking gerrymanders are always illegal or done with ill intent though. So you've probably seen this other one that uh, I'm going to show you here, the earmuffs of Illinois. This looks highly suspect as well, right? Like it's probably worse than the snake by the lake, honestly. But the earmuffs of Illinois 
are uh, like their area surrounding it, or even the area in the middle, and the earmuffs themselves are all solidly democratic districts. The idea here was uh, basically in the north of downtown Chicago and south of downtown Chicago, you have large Hispanic minorities. And the idea was to basically connect them with an underpass, highway underpass over here to create a seat in which the Hispanic minority could safely elect one representative, the first Hispanic representative from Illinois in the 1990s. However, uh, people still have uh, misgivings about these things because ultimately we have debates about what are the right metrics for it, to understand the gerrymander, to judge it, to say that this is too far and this is too little. Uh, Jonathan is going to talk to you more about it, but there are a couple of baselines that we try to follow when we are redistricting. So what does this mean for us in Connecticut? Well, we try to follow four big ideas, four big rules when we are doing redistricting, and the commission is doing it right now for the state uh, seats. So districts, like Gail mentioned earlier, should have equal populations. They should be uh, in Connecticut within 1% of each other, though the state, uh, Supreme Court has previously ruled even 0.07% uh, as an illegal gerrymander. Uh, here in Connecticut, the rule is that for the U.S. state, uh, U.S. House seats, we try to keep towns whole, so no, not uh, lines running through towns, unless there's an exception, unless the commission cannot come up with a way to keep them uh, intact. Uh, the, uh, rule is, uh, the third rule is that all districts have to be contiguous. You can't have a district that's two separate parts. They have to be connected. That's why we have the like, highway underpass connections and the earmuffs, for example. And no district can have holes in them. So basically, one district cannot be fully enclosed in another one. Now, Jonathan is going to show you guys some maps of what uh, potential redistricting for the U.S. House can look like in our state. So the first thing that we wanted to do is look at the current congressional districts to try to understand them before we decided on uh, what our examples could look like. So currently we have five districts, right? Uh, district one being Harford and its uh, surrounding towns. You have district two, which is the eastern part of the state. District three, which is uh, what I call New Haven County and Friends. And then uh, district four is Fairfield County and uh, five is, is Western Connecticut. Now there's a few things that stood out to us about the map as it currently sits. One, population deviation is too high, right? Both uh, Dr. Johnsoy and Dr. Alberta mentioned earlier, we have to stay below this 0.75% threshold. The other thing was we have split towns, right? And I think a lot of this has to do with the uh, the fact that the 2013 map, which is the one that we're currently working on, with rather, was uh, only slightly modified from the 2003 map. I think if you look you know, at previous iterations, there was a lot of difference between the way that they were composed, whereas this one's really just minimal changes, likely it's just to make the population totals kind of make sense. Um, so the picture there is an example of Waterbury having pieces of two different districts in it. Um, one thing you also notice is that uh, as far as party control goes, only two of them are considered uh, competitive, and that's District 5 and District 2. And the other three are considered you know, Democratic locks. Um, from a population perspective, District 2 and District 4 are the ones that are kind of out of whack. Uh, you'll notice District 2 is about 20,000 shy of the goal of about 721,000 residents per district, and District 4 is about 25,000 too many. Uh, so the first map that we set out to do is largely the same strategy as the 2013. So how can we only make changes at the, at the precinct level so that we can right, create these population totals that they're supposed to be? So you'll notice that we still have some split towns and rather unorthodox looking districts. Um, so that, 
as I mentioned, we, we made sure that our populations were equal, but we didn't make any changes for compactness or anything else. The chart that you see there is just showing right, the difference between the current population totals and the ones that we created. So we were able to equalize them as much as we could. Now, what you see here is the minimal changes map that I just showed you, but with the boundaries from the current map on top of it. So I think the, you know, the largest changes are, you know, District 4 has expanded some, District 3 as well, but 1, 5, and 2 are relatively the same. So this is something that could come up if they decided to, to move in the same way they did the last time. Now the second example, I call it compact districts, right? We made sure that every town uh, isn't split, right? We have full towns and we wanted to make our boundaries as clean, crisp, and ideal as possible. Um, in doing so, we were able to make District 5 much more competitive. I think there's uh, a two and a half point bump on the uh, Republican side, and um, District 3 also comes in a little more competitive. Um, the only thing is District 4 ended up being a little less, but all things considered, this is something that we would like to see when these maps are drawn. Uh, here we have the same thing with the uh, current 2013 maps laid on top of the, uh, the compact maps. And I think you can see just how much cleaner and, and easier to understand that map is compared to the one laid on top of it. Um, the application that we used in order to create the maps has some uh, analytical features built into it. So I just wanted to show here, there's I think uh, five different measures that they look into. Right? So competitiveness, minority voter representation, proportionality, splitting, and compactness. So in every category, right, the map that was just shown beat out what we currently have. So in this case, the larger the number, the better. All right, so you can see the compact districts right, are scoring higher than the, uh, the last one. And our last one, I wanted to create something that was unorthodox, but right, fit all of the legal requirements. I dubbed it the barking puppy. I think um, some of you might see something else. I, th I think District 2 kind of looks like a trident too. But, um, so here we largely followed the same uh, strategy in making sure that we used full towns. There were no splits. We were able to equalize the population and create something that was rather unorthodox. That said, we also created a democratic stronghold in four of the five districts, right? Only so District I 5 is complete. Are you okay with the weird talking more directly into it? The better? Yeah, better. Okay. District 5 is the only one that's competitive, and that's because it was built off of the other map that, that we had. So um, that's you know, a legal gerrymander. Uh, and here you can see kind of... Uh, the same thing with uh, the 2013 map on top of this one. And I think one thing that you can see is our current map, right, District 1, doesn't look that much different from what I created here. So just to recap, based on the requirements that are expected of us, right, the compact districts and the legal gerrymander meet them all with the exception of the minimal change map because we still had splits similar to what we currently have and the right, current 2013 maps don't have whole towns and obviously have a huge population deviation. Um, I just wanted to shout out the application that we use and that's Dave's redistricting app. Actually, Mehmet found it <laughs> and is really useful in doing this and it's something that everyone can uh, gain access to and, and use to create maps and kind of toy with the way that these things are constructed. And we use QGIS in order to show you that overlay um, with the data that we extracted from, from the application that we used. Uh, and I'd like to thank Michael Gurge, who's not here with us, but is the graduate assistant for the program that helped me in developing all of this. Um, I did want to make a disclaimer, and that's that you know, we stuck to right, the most basic requirements of the maps that we created.
And there's a lot more nuance in the way that, especially smaller boundaries like state house, state senate, or even RTM districts are constructed. So I don't want to make it look too easy because there's a lot that goes into these processes. Um, and some of the additional considerations, right, are crossing county and town boundaries, which for certain districts aren't allowed. Uh, smaller populations make it really hard to use whole towns. Uh, we, you know, we played around with state senate and state rep districts, and it's very difficult because the numbers rarely match up with anything close to what the town populations are. Um, and so, again, take this all with a grain of salt, and then I'll uh, pass, it, pass it off. Uh, proportionality means uh, of the underlying vote, uh, do parties get roughly equal numbers of representatives? So that's the metric, and as you saw, that was at zero. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. <laughs> You don't realize how short you are until you get a laptop and a podium. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? You can. <laughs> uh, so Jonathan, thank you. Um, so now we're going to talk about this impact of redistricting that it has on a variety of different things, but in particular I wanted to look at the three uh, big things that we think about uh, when it comes to redistricting. Electoral college, federal funding, and then representation. So the number of electoral votes each state receives is based on the number of people that that state has in Congress. So each state is guaranteed two US senators and one representative, therefore three electoral votes. However, we know that the population is in stagnant. I just moved here six years ago now. So um, as the population shifts and people move in and out, so too does the number of electoral votes. So when the government does the US Census, um, the results of that data indicate either an increase if the population shift is significant enough to allocate con additional congressional seats, then the state receives an additional electoral votes accordingly. Similarly, if the state experiences population losses, the number of congressional seats decrease and so too does the number of electoral votes. So in short, the number of electoral votes that a state has um, is the number of U.S. senators plus the number of U.S. representatives. So a, a state with three U.S. representatives has two senators, therefore five electoral votes. So in this way, we see that our electoral um, impact on the electoral college can dramatically shift from year to year to year um, as far as after the census is conducted, or I should say shifts from census to census to census. Um, and so with that, we know that the census, which becomes like the most important document you're going to hear us talk about tonight, um, is also how we do our enumeration. So federal funding for a variety of projects like infrastructure or housing are based off of the U.S. Census. But then the question becomes, who should be counted and how should we be counting? So in this way, the process of counting becomes extremely important and often very political. So each decision that we make about how to count and when to count and who to count is going to impact the results. So for instance, um, this year was the first time that the election, or sorry, can you tell I was just teaching about elections today? Um, this is the first time that the US Census was online. Okay, which is a vastly different method than the old paper ballot or, or wow, uh, paper copy or going door to door. Um, so districts right, can be drawn in a variety of different ways as Jonathan showed us uh, and all of this impacts this idea of representation. So lines can be drawn where we have incumbents that are eliminated such was the case with Ohio. Um, I was actually living in that district when they drew the snake by the lake. Um, and we had one incumbent member of Congress uh, eliminated. Likewise, districts can be carved out to eliminate challengers, right? So you can carve out their house. Uh, this happened um, allegedly to Barack Obama when he was in the state Senate in Illinois where they drew his house into a different district, his block. Um, like, likewise, uh, as we've seen, they can be drawn to, for political advantage or diluting minority votes. 
either way that we determine the lines, we're determining power, political power in particular. Um, and in doing so, we uh, are going to influence things like who controls Congress. The number, the total number of U.S. representatives, it's 435, and that's by statute. Yep, so just to reiterate, because I know we are recording this, so I want to make sure to get uh, your uh, question on, on the recording. So yes, uh, the number of U.S. Uh, House of Representative seats is in statute, and that is 435 voting members. We have three non-voting members, and those three electoral votes go to Washington, D.C. per the Constitutional Amendment. Um, the, that number, 435, doesn't change. So as we have grown in population, um, we've just reallocated out that. So let's just say hypothetically, uh, right, so like hypothetically if um, Texas were to get really large, right, in population, they would just get more um, versus, let's say, Connecticut, if we lose population. That being said, the kind of important thing to think about and what I would tell my students is what is the number of people that are represented per, per U.S. rep? So currently, um, I think this year it's right around seven, what was it, 760? I think Quantic is about right on the money, so 730-ish. Okay. I think so. Uh, so right around 730,000 this year. So you take that, that math, total population, divide it out by 435. Yeah, and then, right, so back in the day, if we go back a couple hundred years or 100 years, the population might only been 200,000, and you divide it out. Right, so there, actually, if you look at Article One of the Constitution, where the, enu the enumeration clause is, it actually outlines how the first couple of Congresses did do the head count. And, um, and that's why we also have, in 1929, that law that allows for us to uh, determine how we do the count, too. Um, so, no, you're fine. Uh, so one of, one of the points, and it's actually an interesting question to, to jump into at this time, is because all of this does control power, right? Who is, represented, who is represented and how are they being represented? So for instance, if um, we allocate seats out in a certain way or draw district lines in a certain way, like Jonathan showed in one map, we can actually allow one party uh, you know, to have more seats in Congress than another. Not always does that mean we've been uh, malicious in drawing those lines. Sometimes it is kind of you know, the way the process works. But either way, that not only affects Congress, therefore the makeup of Congress, right, that also would then include things like the makeup of our state general assembly, our uh, possibly our local government, so think school boards, city councils, uh, things along those lines. Um, but then what that does is that then impacts our public policy. What issues are we going to bring to the table? Okay, what matters will Congress take up? What will they be voting for? Okay, what projects or programs or services are going to be funded? Which ones will receive more funding? And then on the flip side, which programs or services are going to receive less funding or be eliminated or cut? Okay, um, what about our policies? Which policies are going to be tabled as a result of who holds power? And then what issues might be ignored? because of who holds power. So it, it's you know that double-edged sword, right? Um, which brings us to like who, how we draw lines matters because it's about who we elect and then what they bring to the table in their legislative bodies. 
Uh, so bottom line is that redistricting impacts um, who is being represented, and then the next layer of that is what will of the people, or whose will, is being represented um, in that legislative body. And with that, I'm going to let you talk about alternatives. Okay. <laughs> So one of the first, I'll, uh, I'll change this out, okay. So one of the first alternatives I'm going to talk about, and I'm gonna offer brief sketches of these, and I'm happy to talk more about them if people are interested, is that we can abandon single member districts. We can have a different type of political representation than what, what we have now. So let's take a look at the 2020 results in our state. So Connecticut has been fairly stable in its partisan makeup for a couple of presidential cycles now. Usually we get something around 40% Republican votes and something around 60% Democratic votes. In, pretty, in a majority of Democratic ca uh, countries around the world, this would give Republicans two seats in the US uh, House and Democrats three seats. However, for the last couple of cycles, we've had a solid five seat Democratic majority. So this is that proportionality problem, right? Like there is about what 750,000 Republican voters in this state that never get candidates of their preference represented. And m the, a majority of democratic countries around the world have proportional representation systems in which uh, political parties get awarded representatives based on their share of the vote rather than whether they won a plurality in uh, every district that they were running in. Now, this does present some problems for us. The biggest one is that it's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court in 1970 decided that having more than one person running for office in a single district, so having a multi-member district, was unconstitutional. I think the Supreme Court's interpretation in that case was misguided, to say the least, because the reasoning was very briefly that having more than one representative took away the people's chance to cast a tie-breaking vote. Because if there's just one election happening, every vote can be the tie-breaking vote. If there are two elections happening, two people from different parties get, can get elected. Uh, and they read that as a uh, breaking of the principle of one person, one vote. Again, I think that's a misguided way of reading it because in many of our districts, no one gets to cast a tie-breaking vote. They are safely partisan. The second alternative I'm going to, again, just briefly sketch out here is having a national registry. As uh, Dr. Alberta mentioned, uh, the census and our decennial census, the one that we do every 10 years, plays an incredibly important role in our political processes. And it's a fundamentally, like, it's an incredibly useful tool, but it's a flawed tool. Like, because it's such a hard thing to do to go out once every decade and try to count every person living in this country. Uh, we know that the census has huge problems of data collection. So for about 30 years up until the mid-1990s, the census had a very well-established scientific undercount in counting especially Hispanic residents, but also like hard to reach populations everywhere. Even today, counting the homeless population, for example, which on any given day is about half a million people in the country, is basically impossible. So we know that the census misses these groups. And we also know that we can't really do much. In the mid-1990s, we've coupled the actual headcount with a sampling approach, which tries to uh, calculate how many people we could be missing and tries to add those numbers to the census. That has been a hugely politicized process as well. The second problem here is the periodicity of the census, the fact that it only happens every 10 years. As Jonathan showed you earlier, uh, every 10 years, representation gets completely out of balance in our current system, with uh, like 4% difference here in Connecticut alone, which, again, we haven't been a very mobile population state over the last decade. Think of states like California, which uh, ended up losing a seat oh, this cycle because for the first time in 200 years, they've lost population. Or Texas, which gained, I think, two states this time, uh, two representatives this time around, because so many people are moving in. When population movements are that rapid, the census gets out of date very quickly, 
And because we only do it every 10 years, we have to live with those consequences, with people getting under or overrepresented for a solid decade, for five Congresses. The last thing I'll mention is, again, a majority of democratic countries around the world don't deal with their political representation problem this way. They have national registries. Every person living in the country is registered somewhere. They know where their population is. And uh, in addition to the political solutions, it makes life a lot easier. But for our specific problems, a national registry offers some solutions too. So for example, the fact that voter registration is such a chronic problem in our uh, electoral system could be sidestepped by a national registry that keeps that gets being updated by a federal national registry or the fights over voter ID and what types of ID are admissible would be sidestepped if we had a national registry that gave every person an ID card uh, it would make representation much more accurate, especially if we did redistricting more frequently based on uh, population movements. And finally, it would make apportionment, the movement of seats between states, much more fluid. And it would, uh, for example, the census would stop being this like high stakes exercise where New York loses a seat because 800 fewer people were counted. And if 801 peop more people were counted, it would have kept its seat. So as I said, these are very brief sketches of these alternatives. There are a couple of other ideas I'm happy to throw around if people are interested. But we'll throw it to you guys and let you guys ask us some questions. And we'll try to connect with Kurt. So the national uh, voter uh, ID is a, is a great, uh, sounds like an interesting solution, potential solution. Who's against it and why? <laughs> thank you for, uh, yeah, thank you for starting with the easy stuff. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Ella, do you mind? We have a student that can do this. OK, Kurt is online. Great. You want oh. to introduce yourself, Kurt, real quick? Hi, I'm going to work with him and uh, work on this uh, project with, uh, with Gail, Jonathan, and uh, Mehmet. And it was uh, fascinating. It's, it's a fascinating process. And you can see how, how many plans you can create. Um, there's no, there's no magical one plan. And I just would add one thing. That is that in some states, in, in most states, um, the elect, the uh, reapportionment process is through the state legislature, and the political party that controls the state legislature controls the reapportionment process. And there has, there are a number of states, however, who have gone to a bipartisan, uh, non-political um, process. So that's possible to do. Thank you, Kurt. So I'll go back to the question of why we don't have a national registry. Uh, it's a complicated answer, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, the easiest way to frame, frame it is to think of it as a politically very contested thing in the United States. Uh, because there's so much, uh, I mean, there are different schools ideological opposition to it from like people on the right thinking of it in terms of like creating a registry of gun owners, for example, and all the like fears and anxieties around that, to people on the left thinking about the same thing and like hearkening it back to like McCarthyism. Because the idea that the federal government would track all of us down individually is a scary thing to many people. Now, I would argue that this is a, uh, basically we, we are living in a world uh, worst of both worlds where that tracking does happen, but we don't get the benefits of a registry. <laughs> yes. Social security card. Yep. And if you moved, it would come with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so definitely agree with you so again like we have the tracking system but we don't employ it where it would actually do the most good for us or one of the places where it would do the most good for us thank you for the question other questions hi i have two mm -hmm. um 
what percentage of the states do have bipartisan processes like Connecticut does? Can you hear me? Okay. And what percentage have independent commissions? And what are controlled by state legislatures, which is part one. Part two is how much danger in this country right now is there of permanent minority rule. So one of the things that um, we did initially look at was your first question, right? What does that look like? How would that play out? Would it be different, right, the results? Um, we didn't go down that rabbit hole uh, just because we wanted to keep it centered on Connecticut. Um, however, uh, I have lived in a state that has one of everything. <laughs> so, um, and it's a, it's a completely different process in the sense of uh, timelines or the ability to draw the maps. I mean, it's still politicized in either way because in reality you are determining a lot of things that have to do with power. Um, but the bipartisan independent kind of commissions are coming up, I think, more and more frequently um, in today's uh, world. I'm actually going to look that up right now on the website yeah. that lists all of them. So while Gail is looking that up, uh, I can add a couple of things, which is the uh, bipartisan commissions that the question was about that Kurt mentioned earlier, can look very different from state to state. So for example, in California, it is a uh, ballot initiative initiated process where they passed it in 2008, if I remember correctly. And uh, basically they take applications from Republicans, Democrats, and independents. They're Applications are reviewed uh, by independent people and by the legislature, and like there are quotas from each. So by basically making it a very arduous process, they try to make sure that committed people end up getting through, and it seems to be working relatively okay for them. Their maps are already in, unlike ours. <laughs> so there's something to be said for that. But in other states, I think it was Iowa Gale when we were looking at it, uh, has a very different setup where the legislature appoints the uh, commission and they've had similar problems to politically run uh, redistricting processes. So an independent commission, uh, the success or failure of it is usually determined by who, uh, like the processes in which the commissions are appointed. Yeah, so for congressional districts, 33 states have state legislators that draw them, so that's majority. Um, eight use commissions, and two states use a form of a hybrid where they do a commission uh, in conjunction with the state legislator. For state legislative districts uh, to be drawn, you have 33 use the state legislator, 14 use commissions, and three use hybrids. Um, can, can, I have, can, can I have another thought here? Yeah. Go for it, Kurt. Um, what's, what's happening is we're, we're in a polarized political moment, for sure. But there's also, um, there's also a spatial part to that, in that the population of the country is sorting itself out where people live uh, along, for example, education lines. So in Connecticut, we looked at the, what are called enumeration districts, where we're doing a project for the Greenwich United Way. And there are some parts of uh, town, in Fairfield County, where um, all of the adults, Actually, all of the adults living in, in, in two adjacent neighborhoods have a college degree or higher. And then there are other parts of the state where it's just the opposite. The proportion of, of people with college degrees is, is, is below the, the, uh, the US 33%. It's much lower than that, it's 10%. Um, and politically, that matters because we've seen in the past couple of years, the past couple of elections, um, uh, really split voting along um, education lines. And so if we live in, in, in these different neighborhoods, and that's sometimes why, why, why you, have to, you have to draw those long lines, you gotta reach enough people who you want to be in a particular district by based on their, their demographics and their income. 
good, good evening. Um, my first question, I have two. My first question uh, is in, pertains to the difference between the enumeration, uh, individual enumeration of individuals um, and the statistical modeling of, of um, or account for the census. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, essentially, in your opinions, is uh, a statistical modeling form of counting constitutional? And I mean, I would argue, especially as, as you know. Can you repeat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will. We will. Okay, oh, yeah, it, I, I'm just not close enough. Um, so it's, it's, it's in regard to individual uh, enumeration or counting of people versus statistical modeling uh, and trying to get a proper and accurate count in that respect. Um, and if that would be more beneficial, how constitutional that may be. And then the second one, the second question, doesn't necessarily relate to redistricting, um, but the census leaves out a lot of people, including those experiencing homelessness, as we talked about. And the same individuals also are systematically disenfranchised. You know, those individuals, in order to register to vote rate, you have to have an address. Um, and they usually ask you where that address is when you go to vote or voter ID laws prohibit you know, individuals who, who don't have IDs, homeless people do not have those, or they don't have the vital records in order to gain IDs, yeah. even if those will be paid for by the state that has voter ID laws. So a lot of, a lot of uh, barriers to individuals who may attempt to register. And how could we solve those problems, those s systematic disenfranchisements, um, and would a national registry help in that respect? It's, very, it's, it's a lot, so it's, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm just going to throw out there that I'm very proud of that question because you took my war in voting class and I see all of it intertwined in here. Uh, I also give a shout out to that class if you want to take it. Um, why don't you go ahead and answer the census one? Sure. You were Kurt. So uh, thankfully I don't have to guess. This has been tried before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said yes it's constitutional. Uh, again a much more like textual reading of the uh, Constitution would probably suggest no. So uh, again, I don't see signs of this, but it's possible that this could be something that gets struck down because it's a very contentious thing because those hard to reach voters tend to have partisan preferences in favor of the Democratic Party. So that means uh, that does make this uh, basically counting those populations by other means a political process because ultimately it's about power like Dr. Alberta keeps saying. Uh, Gail, do you want to yep. tackle the other one? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it to Kurt first. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, but again, it's, the, it's as just as Mehmet said, it's, it's the partisan divide. And uh, look, look, at the, look at the turmoil that we've faced now in these past two years with the COVID and, and trying to reach out to, to, to people. And there are pockets of people who are fully vaccinated. They were vaccinated early. And there were there are pockets of people who won't vaccinate, and they live in a, in in, a, in in neighborhoods where so those two polar groups live in neighborhoods where people are similar to themselves, and then that gets translated into the political process. So you'd find people who would say this is an intrusion in government into my private life, mm -hmm. and I don't want to join any kind of a registry, yeah. and you would find people who would who would be, be supportive. And it's 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 dividing along the partisan lines now, and it's um, it's really really difficult. Do I have it? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to leave that one alone, but I'm going to dive into Tyler your second question, um, which deals with how can we solve this issue of systematically leaving individuals out of the voting process, um, in large part for either the undercounting of certain groups with a census, therefore, right, with redistricting and other initiatives and federal funding, but then also with, uh, I think, respect to just the, the hurdles one needs to go through in order to vote. So one of the things that I teach in my class is that the voting process is three parts. You first have to register to vote, then you have to vote, which is what most people think of. And then there's this third part. This is what I like to think of as the fun part um, and what I research and study, which is how we count the votes, okay? How we count the votes matters just as much as um, 
the who can vote and all of that other um, stuff that comes with that. And there's tons of different laws that you know guide all of these processes. And we know from uh, US history that the founding of the country um, forward, so from the Constitution forward, um, the right to vote is very much a American myth in the sense that constitutionally your uh, vote is a privilege. Um, it is something that has to, had to be earned over time. Whether, you, uh, whether it was disenfranchising the poor, disenfranchising the, um, the illiterate, disenfranchising uh, certain racial and ethnic groups, or disenfranchising women, um, gender. And so if you read those amendments really carefully, what it tells us is not that those groups have the right to vote, but that, though, that we won't discriminate against those groups. So we still can do other things that could potentially have some sort of systematic impact. So to say, you know, what thing, you know, is there a magic wand that would, you know, fix it? You know, the answer is, sure, if I had one, right? Uh, maybe we could, but we don't. And there are things that we can do. We can um, do things like voter registration drives. We could, uh, from the state legislative side, we could ease uh, some of the registration requirements. Like North Dakota doesn't have uh, voter registration. Um, we do some of that, right, when, with the Motor Voter um, Act, the National uh, Voter Registration Act. In 1993, it allows you to do it while you get your license. Uh, we could allow you to register on Election Day like we do in Connecticut um, or before Election Day and then also vote, that's same-day registration. So there are some things that people or states are you know, toying with and adopting that you know, does help that. And what's interesting about the pandemic, to kind of go back to what you guys were saying earlier with your part one question, is the pan my big takeaway as you know, an election science scholar and someone who used to work in, in elections was that if people are given the opportunity to vote, they will. Right. And in, in 2020, one of the things that happened because of the pandemic was we had this conflict over public health and access to the ballot. And then you throw in their election security and integrity. And a lot of states like Connecticut transitioned very quickly uh, to uh, all mail-in balloting. And that allowed the ballot to be delivered to probably more individuals uh, than who would have normally wanted to vote or could vote. Um, more importantly, uh, that election. And so we saw record turnout, both in primaries and in the general election. So I think that shows us that sometimes our, the systematic disenfranchisement that we see is uh, just a kind of a byproduct of, not the only thing, but a byproduct of some of the laws that we have that just create these hurdles that we gotta you know, keep jumping through these hoops you know, to, to get there. Uh, I'll add something very quick because uh, Gail studies these things very extensively. I'm more of an outsider to the subject. And sometimes I think that gives me a little different perspective, which is we don't have the magic wand, but other countries have figured out a way to get one. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Way, way to steal that. <laughs> yeah, a, a, Absolutely. A big, one would, a, a big one would be to vote on weekends. Yeah, yep. ha having the election on weekends. I'll say one more thing. Uh, I'm a double citizen. I come from Turkey. Turkey has horrible problems with its democracy, but it has 90% turnout on voting days. We do one day elections, in person voting only, but we have a national registry, and the National Elections uh, Authority mails you here's your voter ID, show up on the school in this classroom, and everyone knows what's going to happen. All 65 million people know where to go to vote, and 55 million of them vote every election. Yep. There's <laughs> also um, another like steal from other countries would mm -hmm. be to do compulsory voting, Yeah. right, where you are mandated to vote. Um, that's what happens like in Australia uh, or New Zealand uh, in particular. You, now, that doesn't mean that you go there and you have to cast a ballot. You just have to show up. And they have to you know, check you in. And then you can not vote should you choose. The other thing that I would add um, after what you know, Kirk mentioned and is back in the day, election day used to be a party, okay? Like full-fledged, like I know we're in Connecticut, so I'm just gonna say 
the New Englanders back in the day, man, they knew how to throw an election. Like, you would come out, like, parades as you were coming in. Like, they'd pick people up as they're coming down to the town green to vote, and they would just make these big parades, and you'd have music, and you'd have the kids were playing, and the, the wives and the women in the community were out because, you know, you couldn't vote yet. But you were out in the community, and there would be free beer um, and free food. And you would go to that, uh, the town green, you would call your name, so Tyler, since I you know, know you, you're going to stand up, you're going to tell me your vote, you're going to sit back down, I record it, and we keep going. Meantime, you know, there's free beer and food on the town green, and when we're done, we're going to head to the tavern. And it was a big social event. And so, it, now it's on a Tuesday because of uh, mm-hmm. farming, basically. We're an agricultural nation back in the day. Uh, but not only moving it to a weekend, but just having that holiday again um, and having that civic, that social aspect could really increase uh, voter turnout, especially if you're given the day off. And a lot of towns are, are doing this. There's a town in Ohio who started doing it, and they're seeing increases in their local turnout mm-hmm. already. In the state legislature in Wisconsin, in the vote in the state of Wisconsin, more Democrats voted for Democrats. Mm-hmm. But the way that it's, it's districted, the way that the districting works, there are more representatives in the state legislature that are Republican. Mm-hmm. That makes no sense. It would seem to me that's unconstitutional, right? I mean, yeah. Explain to me how that would work in the same society. Yeah. I mean, horrible, yeah. Interesting. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, So thank you for the comment slash question. Uh, I think it is a huge problem for uh, American democracy in the sense that like if and it's not just like what's happening within Wisconsin, but Connecticut is not uh, gerrymandered that heavily. So compared to them, if votes in Connecticut are much more competitive uh, as opposed to votes in uh, Wisconsin. So we end up with not just partisan imbalances there, but what votes mean uh, across states differ significantly. Now, uh, in 2018, the uh, Supreme Court did take this up, uh, and Wisconsin and Maryland were the two states where the Supreme Court was asked to vote, is partisan gerrymandering to this extent unconstitutional? The Supreme Court basically said that it could be, but courts are not where this should be decided which is a problematic way because we don't have any other body which can make these decisions. So basically we are now in a system in which we think it's unconstitutional, but no one can ascertain that it is. <laughs> so I don't know that there's a way out of this uh, conundrum, other, unless Gail has a magic wand in her back pocket. It, yes. it would take either some sort of amendment to the Constitution or some sort of statutory law that could then be enforced. Um, since the Supreme Court isn't really touching it, because they would be then the ultimate authority, right? They have the power of the supremacy clause. Yeah, but we do teach it, Ella can tell you. <laughs> aren't, aren't there provisions in the John's, uh, John Lewis voting rights advancement law that mm-hmm. would, um, that would Im- that would make these things better, um, and it and it would be sta- like by statute, as you're as you're saying, it wouldn't we wouldn't put it in the Supreme Court's lap because we're very afraid of putting it in the Supreme Court's lap right now. Yeah. So the voting bill that you're talking about, um, that is, I think it's stalled in the Senate right now. Um, it would change. So the last time we had a huge voting rights act of any kind was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Then we had Motor Voter in 93. Um, and all of that does, it, it gives us some sort of national precedent, right? And then the states have to follow, because of the supremacy clause, they have to follow that. So uh, yes, to answer your question, it, it could tell the states what to do. Um, and it could then, you know, uh, change some state laws. Which ones in particular would be dependent on how the bill was, uh, comes out of the Senate and how it, you know, would be signed into law. So I'm not going to speculate on those changes, but um, it, it would have some sort of power, right? Um, now the states, 
in that sense, too, we're a federalist, we have a federalist constitution, we're a republic, and we have democratic values. So it's also, you know, states do have sovereignty here as well, right? Um, so there would be then maybe this question of, is this a right reserved for the states? It had been, if you look at the original constitution, the first seven articles, and even the first 10 amendments, um, they didn't touch voting, right? And who should vote, or voter qualifications with a 10-foot poll, um, 100-foot poll even, right? So uh, they left that to the states. And then we saw that uh, the federal government encroached on those uh, qualifications and determining that over time for you know a variety of reasons, right? The Civil Rights Act, uh, allowing women to vote, et cetera. So um, that would be probably the, you know, some states would have that perspective of it, viewing it as that encroachment um, that could then maybe go into a legal challenge, depending, and then the Supreme Court would have to determine uh, that. Um, or it could not, right? But, you know, there's, there's a will, there's a way all the time, right? <laughs> I'll talk a tiny bit about the technical side of this, which is uh, like, at least with uh, the uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act, we now have the legal technical mechanisms through which we determine, like does a law or does a gerrymander uh, violate the uh, Voting Rights Act? With partisan gerrymanders, we don't have established ones yet, but there are now technical measures out there. You might have heard of some of them, like the efficiency gap that tries to measure like how much of partisan votes relatively are wasted in each district. Uh, I think with further development of those tools, we might get to a point where it becomes actually enforceable if the, some version of the law was, was to pass. Jonathan, Kurt, chime in. <laughs> no. uh, just a, a further thought. Um, mm -hmm. With, with the partisan nature of many, many of those 435 congressional districts, um, the, the, the general election is, is far less important than the primary. So in many districts that, that are either Republican or Democratic, it's, it's, it's the primary that really matters because there are not enough people of the other party in the district because they've been eliminated to have a contest in the general election. And then what that allows um, is, for, um, is for the fringe of the two parties, there's all sorts of fringes, they then have really disproportionate power. Mm -hmm. I want to, uh, before we wind up, and I th uh, one thing I want to say is partly what we're talking about talking about partisan gerrymandering, gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering, but we haven't said the term that's usually used, extreme partisan gerrymandering, mm -hmm. which is where the courts step in or you start to have trouble and, or violate versus one person, one vote, or other state statutes or constitutional ones. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, could you talk a little bit about the involvement of the student? Oh. what their no. reactions were, how much they knew, how valuable the exercise was to go through this for the curriculum mm -hmm. and for you personally. Well, I think we have two here. Mm -hmm. yeah, they both are just like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to start with yours? And, Absolutely. And then I'll talk about mine. So uh, for my students, they focused on countries outside of the US, like looking at their electoral systems, how they do redistricting. And uh, we tried to cover a wide variety of countries, not just Western European democracies, but like large democracies like India, uh, more problematic democracies like Brazil, and trying to understand like, what do these processes look like? And I think it was very informative for them to understand First of all, so many of the problems we're talking about are uniquely American in the sense that like, redistricting happens everywhere, but nowhere is it this like, politically contentious process that we live through. Even in countries like the UK, where the electoral system is very similar, partially because uh, their House of Commons has uh, variable numbers, so people, like the number of districts change 
across the country so that they can reallocate as needed and it becomes much less of a political, uh, I don't know, barrel bomb, whatever you might want to call it. Uh, the second thing is I think they found it very useful to then compare it to the US because we spent about three weeks in class talking about the American system. And then at the end of their project, they compared Italian uh, redistricting process to the American one, the British one, the uh, Australian one, the Indian one. And I think, uh, at least from having read all of them last night to prepare for today, it looks like a, a lot of them came to appreciate the uh, the fact that uh, the American democracy has not been updated in a long time. Because, uh, I mean, this is not a new observation by any means, but the fact that it's so hard to change our constitution mm -hmm. makes some of these like gradual changes that other countries have been able to uh, achieve over the last hundred years impossible here. And like, we can talk about this in terms of many other things from the welfare state to everything else, but the electoral system is definitely showing its age too. Yeah, um, so one of the things that I did is um, I brought it into my public administration class, which you know you wouldn't think would work, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about redistricting, but there is a lot of choices that go into something like this. And so they got to um, exercise and utilize concepts like federalism and bureaucratic discretion and accountability and all those fun things. Um, and so my students were tasked with creating, well, first of all, researching, um, redistricting, and I did not give them much direction because oftentimes um, our processes are very vague, right? And we have to determine how to figure that out. So I just said, tell me about redistricting, um, probably much to their chagrin. And then they had to develop websites that explained that process to an average American. Um, and that's what they did. So they did everything from websites on the, con uh, the census and how that plays a role in redistricting to the different ways that states do it um, to gerrymandering and mail apportionment conversations on on a website um the history of it and why we are doing what we're doing uh, so it was really unique and to get at the educational aspect um uh Mehmet and i uh, created a survey and the students took it beforehand and it asked them a variety of questions some of them were knowledge based about the process and then others had to do with i think um kind of course concepts and curriculum and then um and then personal questions as far as um like you know is this useful right those kinds of questions so we tried to measure and then at the end i should say at the end of it they will also be taking a survey a follow-up survey so we have a pre and a post test where um, we're going to see if knowledge levels changed we're going to see if it's a useful tool in the classroom uh, doing a project like this and does it meet our each of our classes like goals and objectives mm -hmm. and then also citizenship outcomes does something like this engage you enough to become interested in and part of the process um so those results will be forthcoming <laughs> <laughs> well, next time stay tuned <laughs> And then I will say the Center for Social Impact, they um, have research um, assistants that played an integral role in this process as well. And so I'll let yeah. you and Jonathan talk about I that. I think for well, it's Michael, myself, and, and Kurt, um, I think the, the biggest thing was trying to figure out where to start. Right? Like when, mm -hmm. in coming up with these maps, I think obviously it's an iterative process, and we needed to start with what we had and try to come mm -hmm. up with something new. But I think that entire process, process was enlightening and thinking about just how complicated it must be at the state senate, state house level. So I think, you know, from us, it was definitely, you know, an interesting exercise. I think one of the things that came out of conversations uh, prior to this was, you know, whether it makes sense to come up with some type of um, kind of continual project, really looking at analyzing, right, how competitive, how compact, all those measures that we talked about before, uh, some of our, our state districts are on a regular basis. So I think that's something that we would really like to see uh, and, and potentially work on. But um, 
overall really interesting and um, I'm looking forward to working on things like this again. Yeah, and I, I'll just uh, put a plug in for the league. Um, they've done events here at Fairfield uh, on and off for a while now, and it's always cool when they come to you with like this like unique idea, and they're like, oh, what do you think about this? Could it be? And then instantly you start, you get to think about, because of the various projects and connections that we're all mm -hmm. involved in, uh, when you know Kirk, before he retired, he was in the MPA program with me. Um, Mehmet and I were in a um, faculty learning community because of a grant. Jonathan is my former MPA student, now graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get to see these connections and now they're in these roles and you're like, oh, look at this, it's a great idea. Um, and you get to pull them in. And the synergies that are there are so cool. And the way that you can just bounce things off and build these amazing things, I think that is, um, very unique, and and I would say thank you to the league for allowing us that to have Absolutely. that opportunity. Yeah, and we thank you very <laughs> much. We've been honored. The collaboration has been great. <laughs> Let's do it again. Yes. <laughs> we have before you go. If you want to hit the next slide, we do have real quick um, the kind of the league's upcoming events. I just wanted to make you aware of those. For more information, you can go to their websites or talk to um, anyone here with the league. And Kurt, thank you for uh, thank zooming you in much. with us. No, that was it. Was fun. It was fun. <laughs>